Hello and welcome to the first episode in the second series of Among the Ancients, a close readings podcast from the London Review of Books. If you've already listened to the first series, then thank you for sticking with us. If you haven't already listened to series one, well, obviously it's highly recommended for its own sake, but isn't necessary as a precursor to series two. I'm Thomas Jones, an editor at the LRB and long ago a student of Greek and Latin. And talking to me as ever is Emily Wilson, professor of classical studies at the University of Pennsylvania and acclaimed translator of both the Odyssey and the Iliad and much else besides. Hello, Emily, and thank you so much for joining me again. Hello, I'm excited to talk to you again. So last time we began with Homer, with the Iliad, which I think we described as a beginning. And today we're going back to another beginning and talking about Homer's near contemporary Hesiod, who flourished around 700 BC. Two of his poems survive, the Theogony and Works and Days. There are other poems that were once attributed to him, but are now known or believed known to be spurious, including The Shield of Heracles and The Catalogue of Women. Today we'll be looking more closely at Works and Days with readings by Hazel Holder from A.E. Stallings' 2018 translation for Penguin Classics, but talking about the other poems too. But first, a bit of biography, since unlike Homer, it seems that there was a known or a knowable or partially knowable individual called Hesiod who composed these poems. So Emily, who was he? Well, we only know what he says about himself or what the poet speaker says about himself. So, of course, as with any ancient or or one could say also modern literary construction, one can approach this with greater or lesser degrees of certainty. But what he says is that his father was an economic migrant who came from Etolia to Boeotia and settled in a village that he describes as a total dump beside Mount Helicon. And he also then tells us these things which are quite hard to treat entirely literally, including that he had a vision of the muses coming to him as he was shepherding on Mount Helicon and the muses gave him the gift of song. He stayed in this dump of a village for his whole life, apart from going one time to Euboea to a funeral games, which included a poetic festival of which he won a tripod. And so that detail about going to the funeral games of this guy called Amphidamus is crucial for the dating because this guy was a historical figure who fought in the Lelantine War. But then, of course, the problem is we don't know when the Lelantine War was, so it doesn't help as much as you might think it would. Should we listen to a reading of that passage? Get ready for the prophet you'll bring home, just like our father, you great fool Perses. Our father, mine and yours, who, failing a better living, took up ships and sailing. He came here in his black ship over the sea, forsaking Aeolian Chimae, so he might flee not wealth, nor riches, nor prosperity, but evil need, Zeus given. He settled down near Helicon in Ascra, wretched town, bad in winter, harsh in summer, not ever pleasant. As for me, I've never sailed the broad sea on a ship, not yet except to Euboea, my one trip, from Aulis, where, once, Waiting in winter's grip, the Greeks mustered a great host to deploy from holy Hellas against fair woman Troy. And that is where I crossed to Calchis once, for the funeral games established by the sons of Amphidamus, great of heart. I won, you hear, with a hymn and took the tripod by the ear and offered it to the muses of Helicon, right at the spot where they first set me on. The path of clear voiced song. So he mentions the Trojan War there in passing, and also as a contrast. I mean, there's a clear contrast between here's this, you know, he's only ever once been on a ship and he's gone to this poetry competition which he won, and he's setting up a contrast, presumably, between himself and the heroes who went to fight at Troy. But is there also an implicit contrast with Homer and with the different kinds of poetry that he writes compared to Homer's poetry? Yes, absolutely. Yes. I mean, I think there's a clear contrast both between his own unheroic, post-heroic age and also between the type of poetry which existed in the same meter and the same performance context, dactylic hexameter poetry, which tells of the Eclea Andro, like the Iliad tells about the deeds of men, the deeds of heroes fighting in wars and crossing the sea. Whereas Hesiod is composing in a genre that doesn't have to do with crossing the sea. And that image of crossing the open sea as a metaphor for epic poetry is clearly present in 
in the Books and Days depiction of himself as a non-sailor, as an anti-sailor, because he's localizing his poetry in rural, non-heroic, non-military environments. And the idea now, I mean, Homer is more famous than Hesiod. He's also more read than Hesiod. He's more, if you're thinking of who is the first of and the first among the ancient Greek poets, a lot of people would say Homer. But there was this Greek poem from the second century AD known as the Contest of Homer and Hesiod, which imagines Hesiod defeating Homer to win that tripod at the funeral games of, of Amphidamus. And that's clearly fanciful, but it does show that Hesiod was thought in classical times to be at least Homer's equal as a poet, or, or is there an irony in that poem, the idea that Hesiod would beat Homer? I think there's a lot of irony, but it can also be serious. I mean, in antiquity, it was assumed that Hesiod came before Homer. I mean, in the lists of who were the earliest poets, there were the two mythical poets, Orpheus and Musaeus, and then there's Hesiod and then there's Homer. And they're imagined as, in a way, the two alternative ways of writing dactylic hexameter poetry. And that contest story, as you say, it comes from the second century CE, but it's probably a much, much older legend about these competing genres. And in the story, the audience loves the work of Homer. And, and of course, it's much more exciting and it has much more goes on in the work of Homer, whereas Works and Days has a lot of grousing and a lot of superstition about when do you plant your crops and when do you pee in the fields and when do you beget children and all that kind of stuff. Whereas the Iliad inspires you to want to fight. So in the story of the contest, the Iliad and the Odyssey to some extent are presented as both much more exciting and entertaining, but also better politically because they're not going to make people want to kill each other in quite the same way. And also, I mean, of course, Hesiod's poems are much shorter than those attributed to Homer. That the Theogony and Works and Days are each shorter than many of the single books of the Odyssey and the Iliad. I mean, assuming that this the story about going to Euboea and competing in the poetry contest and winning is true, whatever that means, is there any reason to think that the poem that won might have been the Theogony, or is it just sort of nice to think that because it's the other one we have and it's nice to sort of make these connections, but <laughs> there's no real reason to to believe it. <laughs> It's nice to make these connections, and it, I mean, it does seem as if the Books and Days is looking back to the Theogony. I mean, we'll talk in a minute about the question of how many strifes there are. But Hesiod says that he won the prize for a hymn or a poem about the gods, which seems like that could have been the Theogony, because, of course, the Theogony, which the title meaning birth of the gods or genealogy of the gods, does have to do with the gods and does allude to the genre of hymns to the gods. So it's possible. It's, it could well be, yes. Another thing that, that maybe is worth bearing in mind is that, of course, both the Theogony and Works and Days, like the Iliad and the Odyssey, come out of a tradition of oral performance poetry and were experienced in performance, presumably in the same kinds of contexts and religious and civic festivals as the Iliad and the Odyssey. So maybe there's a way that the two Hesiodic poems we have are both set up for performance, but maybe different kinds of audiences, that there's a way that the Theogony is focused on aristocratic succession and focused on people in positions of power and how they hand power down to their sons, whereas the Works and Days implies a very different kind of audience where the focus is on the household and how to get on with your awful brother, which is a different, <laughs> different kind of context from the much more public square context implied by the Theogony. And the other thing about the Theogony, or one of the other things about it, and presumably among the reasons that in the ancient ordering of the poets why Hesiod was thought to come first is because it tells a Genesis myth or, or a number of Genesis myths about the beginnings of the world and also about the beginnings of poetry. Because, I mean, even its opening line has, was it, Musaun Eliconiadon Arcometh Aedain? So from the Muses of Hadakon, have I said that all right? Yes. Um, <laughs> let, let us begin to sing. The idea that this, the first line of the poem includes the words, let us begin to sing, which you don't have quite in the Iliad. It's more like, you know, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. It's a it sounds like the beginning of something. Well, there's an invocation to the muse in both the Homeric epics. But you're right, that verb, Arkumatha, suggests this is the beginning of something in a very explicit way, where it's both the beginning of poetry and the beginning of the world out of the chasm of chaos. And, then, and maybe also just to mention, as we're on the biography question, Hesiod, in that opening of the Theogony, puns repeatedly or seems to pun repeatedly on the name Hesiodos, where he names himself, but in the third person and says the muses gave the gift of song to Hesiodos. But then he also repeatedly uses phrases that sound like Hesiod for the muses sending forth song, Hesai Hoson and Hesin Ioidon. 
so even if we think Hesiod really was the name of a real guy, he's also presenting himself as an er poet, where he's the one who sends out song, and the song sender is Hesiod. And the idea that the muses live on Mount Helicon, is that, do we get that from Hesiod? I, mean, I suppose it's impossible yes, to know. That's, the, it, canon- yeah, that's okay. the canonical time. <laughs> I mean, there presumably was actually a cult to the muses on, on Mount Helicon, and the detail about bringing the tripod back, usually one leaves a tripod there because it's kind of heavy to transport across the sea. And the nice thing to do is to donate it to the temple of the local place where you've won it. But he says he dragged it back across the sea. And I mean, one could say maybe that's actually literally happened. One could also say maybe this is an ideology explaining why is there this tripod randomly on Helicon associated with a cult to the muses. So the tripod, like the World Cup, you don't get to take it home with you. I mean, what was it exactly? A tripod is a metal thing with three legs, which sounds like a completely useless object. (laughs) But of course, before microwaves or before modern kitchen technology, the way you can heat things up is to have a metal thing with three legs under which you can have a heat source and you can then heat up either offerings to the gods or things you're cooking. And of course, it was also a symbol of economic power and used as, as a tool of economic exchange because they were made of precious metals. So this is imagining a a culture before fixed coinage. So a tripod is a way of exchanging wealth where you know this is worth a certain amount of money because you have to have a certain amount of precious metal to make one of these metal objects. You know, obviously people couldn't get cash prizes in an era before cash. So tripods in a way are the equivalent of a big cash prize. And easier to transport than a, than a flock of sheep or something. Exactly. Yes. Cattle, I mean, a herd of cattle might be worth the same amount as a tripod of gold, which might be also inconvenient, but less inconvenient than the cows. Thanks for listening to this extract from Among the Ancients 2, a close reading series from the London Review of Books. To listen to the full episode and all our other close reading series, including series one of Among the Ancients, sign up to our close reading subscription at lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.